There's one good thing about living a little longer is that while young people can read history in history books, I lived history. <laughs> a couple of years ago, one of my grandsons was saying about reading in the history about President Sadat of Egypt making this historic trip to Israel and how unprecedented it was an Arab leader going to Israel. And I said, you know, your papa was with President Sadat in Egypt a week before he went to Israel. Well, he was very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> However, many here would remember back on March 31, 1997, when 39 members of a cult known as Heaven's Gate, some of you are nodding, they were all found dead near San Diego in, the, in a home. They committed systematic and organized suicide. The cult leader was a man by the name of Marshall Applewhite. 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 Actually, my team had a video, and I said, you know what, I don't want to give him airtime. He convinced those cult members to take their own life. And he promised them that if they do that, they will meet a spaceship that will take them to heaven. But I cannot forget how the secular media in its blessed ignorance, blissful ignorance, uh, described this group, wait for it, as Christians, <laughs> religious group. And they got that idea from the Bible. Well, I'm absolutely certain that those who reported like that, they've never opened a Bible, let alone read it. And since then, since that time, that absolute and systematic confusion about death and life, heaven and hell, has been reaching even greater height than those days. It's impossible to have believed that back then. But Hollywood make-believe is not alone in creating this confusion and convincing everybody in their movies that when everybody, when they die, they go to heaven. They're not alone. Progressive Christian seminaries, uh, progressive pulpits, and progressive churches have aided and abetted in this confusion. I want you to hear me out, please, because as the professing church continues to abandon biblical truth, the average individual is now like a desperately hungry person who is ravaging their way through a garbage dump. Now, that's the most polite that I can put it. I'm not saying what I really was thinking. But that's not all. Through this utter confusion, it gave and made it easy for con artists and uh, deceivers of all kind, those who prey on the ignorance and the confusion of the populace. So much so that some time ago, Psychology Today magazine, now that is not your average evangelical publication, just in case you did not know. Psychology Today magazine advertised that they want to give a winner, a prize, to the person or to the group that comes up with the most creative scam. Scam. <laughs> <laughs> Don't miss that word, scam, regarding life and death. This is how the winning group or the winning, the prize winning one went. Just listen to it. I'm going to read it word for word, okay? The advertisement went as follows. Wish you were rich. Now you can be. Then it continues. 
If you are one of the growing millions who are convinced of the reality of the reincarnation, here is once in a lifetime offer. First of all, leave us minimum of $10,000 in your will. You can leave more, but 10,000 was the minimum. After you pass away, our professional medium will contact your spirit on the other world. <laughs> there you will tell us when you're coming back and under what name. Upon your return, we regress you to age 21 of this lifetime. Through hypnosis, we will ask you your seven-digit account number. <laughs> Once you give us your number, we will give you a check on the spot for the original investment plus interest. The longer you're gone, the more money you receive. You may come back, find yourself to be a billionaire. Show your future self how much you care and give yourself a generous present and we will do the rest. They won the prize. The best scam. Now, my beloved friends, the scripture could not be more clear about life and death, heaven and hell. It could not be more clear. So as I conclude the series of messages, the visible hand of the invisible God, we're going to see the man of God, Elisha, be taken straight into heaven without tasting physical death. Now, for us who live in the New Testament, the New Testament believers, we know without a shadow of doubt that absence from the body is presence with the Lord. Our eternal life is guaranteed by the very resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead on the third day. But in the Old Testament, before the Lord Jesus Christ came from heaven and paid for the wages of our sin as our Savior and Lord on the cross, God was showing his faithful remnant within the Old Testament, the faithful believers in the Old Testament. He was showing them that their eternal life is assured by what he did with Elijah. Whirlwind. Today, 60%, I want to show you the screen. This came this week, came this week. 60% of so-called Christians in America believe that all religions lead to God and heaven. <laughs> Beloved, this is the greatest deception of our time. Listen to me, it's important. You see, every generation face challenges, face deception, face difficulty, face uh, heresies that they have to absolutely defend the gospel against. Every generation does. This is ours. This is the biggest deception of our time, and we need to be armed and equipped to know how to face that deception. Why do I say this? Because this lie from the pit of hell is Satan's way to keep people from coming to Christ and being saved. Like the deceived Heaven's Gate cult members, today, millions upon millions upon millions of people are being deceived. Hear me right, please. No one, no one, but no one will make it to heaven except those who have received the Lord Jesus Christ as their only Savior and Lord and walked with Him in this life. Regardless of their church affiliation, regardless of family heritage or head knowledge they may have, or even if they performed good works 24-7. Every time I think about this, I think of a story I love to tell because John Wesley is one of my heroes. I might have a little bit of disagreement here and there about some of the theology, fine theological uh, issues with John Wesley, but he's one of the great men of God, paid a heavy price for his standing for the truth of the gospel. 
John Wesley, an evangelist from England, who actually came to Savannah, Georgia, and spent some time here in the United States, founder of the original Methodist church, not the Methodist church that we have now, but in fact, so many, I've talked to enough Methodist pastors, they said, we don't even identify with John Wesley anymore. But John Wesley had a dream, and he tells this dream that first of all, he was carried to the gates of hell. And there when he came to the gatekeeper, he asked the question, do you have Catholics here in hell? Oh, yes, many. Do you have Episcopalians here in hell? Yes, oh, many. Do you have Presbyterians here? Oh, yes, many. Do you have Baptists here? They said, yes, many. And then reluctantly, it's a question that was the burden of his heart. He comes to it and he says, now let me ask you this. Do you have Methodists here in hell? The gatekeeper said, yes, many. As a matter of fact, I'll never forget a story. Somebody came to John Wesley and said, I saw one of your converts back drunk again. He said, I'm not surprised if he was my convert. But if he was Jesus' convert, he wouldn't be back. With deep disappointment, still in the same dream, in the same time, he was carried into the gates of heaven. And there he asked the angel, do you have Catholics here? They said, not a one. Do you have Episcopalians here? Not a one. Do you have Presbyterians here? Not a one. Do you have Baptists here? He said, not a one. Again, reluctantly, the burden of his heart, and so he asked the question, do you have any Methodists here? The angel said, not a one. And in a sense of exasperation, he asked the angel, whom do you have here in heaven? And the angel said, all those who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and have come under his cleansing power. And my beloved friends, for all who have repented of their sins and received Jesus as their Savior, those who received him as the Redeemer and the Lord of their life, those whose names written in the book of life, all, to all of them, the Word of God is very clear. When we die, we go straight to heaven. There is no waiting room. There is no soul sleep. There is no purgatory. There is no clawing your way out. Absence from the body is presence with the Lord. It is instantaneous. instantaneous. It is immediate. It's checking out and checking in. If you have not read my book, Fearless Living in Troubled Time, you need to read it because there I explain what Paul is saying in the Thessalonian epistles of how the Lord, our, our death is presence with the Lord and immediate. If you read 1 Corinthians 15, the apostle Paul said, we're not gonna be naked souls floating in heaven, but we're gonna be, be closed. We're gonna receive an eternal body, a heavenly body, a body like that of Jesus is after the resurrection. As a matter of fact, our Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 16, he makes it absolutely clear. There is no doubt, there is no uh, but or if that there are only two possible locations in which you can spend eternity. No third. Which one will you choose? Heaven with Jesus or hell with Satan? Some of the clergy in the liberal denomination that I used to belong to feeling at the time that God might be calling me to be a missionary there. But they often challenge me publicly when I talk about the assurance of heaven for the believers. Publicly, they would call me arrogant. Arrogant to think that I'm going to go to heaven, to be sure that I'm going to go to heaven. Well, my answer was very simple. It is the height of arrogance to turn down the gracious invitation of the Lord of life. It is the height of arrogance to say to God, yes, I know Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, but I don't believe him. It is the height of arrogance not to fully trust 
in the promise of the Lord God when he said, those who come to me, I will never reject and I'll never turn down. That is the height of arrogance. But I realize, of course, why they say that. You have to understand, I've debated them enough to understand. Now, uh, uh, sadly, it's rampant in the evangelical church. I never thought that would be 30 years ago. Because they think that my confidence, that when I close my eyes in death, I'll be in heaven, and the confidence of every believer stems from the fact that we only go to heaven if we've done enough good work. And therefore, this is as arrogant to say, how do you can be confident that you've done enough good works? <laughs> the confidence does not come from doing good works if I do it 24-7. But our confidence is not in that good work, but it is in the promises of the Lord Jesus Christ because you can never do good enough work. But the promise that those who come to me in no way will I turn down. That's where the confidence come, trusting in the promises of God. Elijah was the man of God who walked with God. Now it's time for him to be in the presence of God. Like Enoch before him, he did not experience earthly grave. He was transformed into his heavenly body on the way up, on the way up. Uh, the Hebrew word for whirlwind means a gust of wind or a, a sudden ray, r surge of whisk breeze. Now, some of us remember when we were younger and we used to be glued on television, watching those bumbling glasses, Clark Kent, remember? And he would go into the phone booth and he will turn around, and voila, Superman. You remember that? That's what happened to Elijah. <laughs> but this was not make-believe. This was not camera tricks. There was not deception. No. It was truly transformation for Elijah. On his way up, the mortal put on immortality. The perishable put on the imperishable. Let me just remind you, take you back, because we've been looking at this now. This is our ninth in the series. Let me remind you that in the past eight weeks, we've been seeing how the visible hand of the invisible God working in this man, Elijah. First of all, we saw him confronting wicked King Ahab by the power of Yahweh. Secondly, then we saw him being hidden by Yahweh in Kareth Brook. Then we saw how God provided for Elijah in the land of Baal worship in Zarephath. Then we saw how God performed miracles in Zarephath. Then we saw the greatest miracle since the book of Exodus when God parted the Red Sea for his children to move from the slavery of Egypt to the promised land. We saw, we saw the second greatest miracle on Mount Carmel when God's fire came down, licked everything in sight. Then we saw how God's loving provision, that one tears me up more than anything else, how God's loving provision for his depressed and discouraged son Elijah in Sinai. And then, praise God, praise God, we saw how God restored him to ministry. Today we'll see how God supernaturally takes him to his very presence in heaven. Turn with me if you haven't already. Second Kings chapter 2. That was so well read for us. Jonathan, 2 Kings chapter 2, page 570. Here we see that Elijah has been given a word. Now, that's unique. Not many of us have been given that some people have been told you got so much to live or how long you're going to be and all that. But generally speaking, that is not very common. 
But he was told by the Lord, Elijah, get ready. I'm going to take you to heaven. <laughs> what a privilege. And so he goes to various locations where there's ministries and ministers and prophets and people that he had worked with and ministries that he found and ministries that he ministered to. He goes to these locations to encourage them in the Lord's work before he departs for heaven. Elisha, who was the heir apparent to Elijah, who is going to be the successor of that man of God, Elisha, apparently only too conscious of the incredible weight of responsibility that is awaiting him. So much so that he sticks to Elijah and he wouldn't let him go out of his sight. He wouldn't let him get out of his sight. He sticks to him. Elisha went everywhere that Elijah went. Elijah implored Elisha to leave him. But Elisha wouldn't hear of it. <laughs> he just wouldn't hear of it. To use a football language and make Monty happy. <laughs> to use a football language, Elisha was in Elijah's shirt all the time. All these towns that Elijah went to, tagging along Elisha with him, have very significant meaning. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. This is not just going from one place to the other. Every one of those has a meaning. I'm going to explain it to you because it will bless you. I know it will bless you. It blessed me. <laughs> First of all, Gilgal, verse 1. Gilgal. What's the big deal about Gilgal? Well, in Joshua chapter 4, we know that Gilgal represents the place of beginning. Gilgal represents a place of security and safety. Gilgal represented the place of sharing and communion. Gilgal represents the place of preparation. Again, from Joshua chapter 4, we know that Gilgal became engraved in the minds and the heart of every Jew. Why? Because there, Joshua put up 12 stones, 12 stones as God commanded him, 12 stones, and he said, the reason for this is I want every future generation of Israel, every child that is come of age would come here and look at these 12 stones and ask the father and grandfather and say, what does those stones mean? And the father should tell the children that this is where God dried up the river Jordan so that Israel might cross over to the promised land. Gilgal is a symbol of preparation. And there, Elijah remembered the beginning of his walk of obedience. From Gilgal, they went to Bethel. Now, Bethel is a, the place of altars. Bethel means the house of God. Beth means house, El, God. Abraham built an altar in Bethel. Jacob built an altar in Bethel. Bethel also is a place of heart searching. Bethel is the place of self-examination. Bethel was the place of sacrifice for the Lord. And there Elijah remember the giving of his life to walk in obedience. From Bethel they went to Jericho. Jericho represents God's victory in battle the prom to the promised land. But also Jericho represents the battles that Elijah fought. The battles that Elijah fought with the prophets of Baal. The, the battles that Elijah fought and, and received victory when he fought with wicked Ahab and Jezebel. Jericho represents the battle with depression and discouragement and defeat past Beersheba into Mount Sinai where God gave him victory. Jericho represents the battle of justice for Naboth. Remember him. From Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho. You know, as I look at this great auditorium, there is no doubt in my mind 
that I see some of you who are at Gilgal at the beginning place. Some of you are in Bethel where you're sacrificing on the altar of Christ. Others have already been through Gilgal and Bethel and now you're in Jericho, the place of victory after great battles, after great battles. You may have faced battles in your home. You may have faced battles in your marriage. You may have faced battles with your rebellious children. You may have faced battles of wrestling with God and wrestling with doubt and fear and unbelief. And now you've made it across the river, praise God. Listen to me very carefully, please. This is my testimony as well. Let that victory be a reminder to every one of us that God who gave you victory before, he will give you victory again and again and again and again. But there's something else here I don't want you to miss. Elijah wanted to walk through these places alone. (laughs) You notice as we're reading the scripture, he he just kept saying to Elijah, you you stay here and let me go here. And and, and Elijah wouldn't hear of it. He wanted to be alone. Uh, In my thinking as I'm preparing and I said, God bless his cotton picking socks. (laughs) He he always wanted to be alone when he shouldn't be. You remember when he left his seventh and he said, I'm going to go up there and go for a day journey when he shouldn't be alone. You want to be alone when he shouldn't be. But Elisha wouldn't hear of it. Thank God for the Elishas. Elisha's love and commitment and devotion would not let Elijah alone. Beloved, this is true friendship. This is true commitment. This is true devotion. And it is rare. Not in this church, but it's rare. Elisha's love and commitment, devotion to Elijah was rewarded by God himself. You see, there is a reward when you pour yourself into somebody else's life. There is a reward when you stand up and hold somebody's. There is a, a, a unique reward for that. And sometimes when people write to me or call me or something and say, oh, I hate, I know you're busy and I hate to bother you, but would you pray about it? I said, stop it. This is not a burden to pray for somebody, to stand with someone in prayer. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. And so the Lord rewards Elisha with double portion for his faithfulness. Now, I cannot leave this without Reminding you again, please don't get tired of me saying this. <laughs> of the blessing of having someone to walk with you in the journey of faith. I know I emphasized it several times in this series, and I want to emphasize it again. If you don't have someone to walk with you, I plead with you, take time, cultivate such a relationship. I know our pastors in this church will be more than delighted to help you and guide you, every one of them. Find somebody who can walk with you. He can walk to your Gilgal with you. He can walk to your Bethel with you. He can walk to Jericho with you and walk with you everywhere you walk. These two men get to the Jordan where unprecedented gust of wind comes through and blows it. And then the chariots of fire take Elijah straight to heaven. His mantle fell. And Elisha in humility picks it up. Let me ask you a question. It's between you and God. If the Lord Jesus himself comes in here today, walks down these aisles and goes to your pew and sits next to you 
and would ask you, what is it that you want? What is it that the burden of your heart? What would you say? Don't let that question go by for a day or two or a month or two. I don't care how long. Stay with it. What would you say? What would you ask him for? Elisha could have asked for fire to come from heaven. But he didn't. Elisha could have asked for power to raise the dead. But he didn't. He was had, God gave him that power anyway later on. The wise man asked for the spirit of the Lord that dwelt in Elijah. This is before Pentecost, of course, before the Holy Spirit come in the New Testament and dwell in the believers. The Holy Spirit used to come and dwell in an individual and to do the work of God, then he departed. That's the Old Testament. Then the deluge came on the day of Pentecost. And we have the Holy Spirit of God now. So he asked for the Spirit of the Lord that dwelt in Elijah. And he asked for him in abundance. You know, James, the half-brother of Jesus, in his epistle, said, you have not because you ask not. But then a lot of people love to just stop here. No, you've got to go on. <laughs> and the reason because you have not is because you ask wrongly, he said. And somebody said, well, Michael, how can I ask rightly? How can I ask rightly for the right thing? Well, listen to me very carefully, please. When it comes to the work of God, when it comes to the glory of God, when it comes to the kingdom of God, God wants us to ask for big things. When it comes to the glory of God, He wants us to ask for the ocean. But what do we do? We take a thimble to the ocean. I can sometimes hear the voice, the sweet voice of my best friend, the Holy Spirit, in a gentle rebuke to me. Why are you only taking a thimble or a small bucket? Can't you see the ocean? There are times the Lord wants us to ask for the mountain, but we contended with the molehill. Now I'm sharing, this is a personal matter for me, and I'm, I don't mind being transparent with you. Because I want to encourage you and I want to encourage myself to ask for big things when it comes to the glory of God. Some of you may have heard me say this before, but I consider one of my weaknesses, my many weaknesses, is to lack in faith in asking for big things. when it comes to the work of God. And that is why I truly, and I must admit I've stayed in this verse for hours, I truly admire Elisha's spiritual gumption I think God wants every one of us to have spiritual gumption. It's a lesson I'm trying to learn. Because when you read on afterward in the great life of that successor of Elijah, Elisha, you see how God answered his prayer in abundance. While Elijah performed four miracles, Elisha performed eight. My beloved friends, this is a reminder. 
It's not just a reminder to you, it's a reminder to me that we need to dare ask for big things from God for God's glory. Dare to ask great things from God, dare to ask mighty things from the, for his kingdom. I dare to ask for the impossible for his glory. When it comes to the work of God, when it comes to the glory of God, when it comes to the kingdom of God, when it comes to saving the lost, when it comes to impacting your world for Christ, you have my permission to be the ultimate in naming it and claiming it. All right? Did you get that? Hello. Some of you are getting nervous. I think Michael crossed over. Now listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. It's, this is important, important distinction. See, these folks who, who preach prosperity and preach naming it and claiming it, they always ask for selfish things. The other day I saw a preacher who was asking his congregation to yell out the, 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 the kind of plane that he wants God to give him, $60 million plane. And he was asking me, yell it out, yell it out. So God, can, God is not deaf. See, this is what I'm talking about. God wants us to ask for big spiritual things for his glory and for his glory alone. There's something else I need to tell you before I bring this wonderful series to an end. I want you to notice that in both the ascension of Elijah in the Old Testament and the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament, in both occasions, they were witnessed only by personal disciples. Did you get that? Now, I know my flesh. I lived with it for a long time. (laughs) If I was staging the ascension of Elijah, I am telling you, I would want to have the whole royal family there. I mean, of Israel. I want to have whoever is left of the prophets of Baal to be there. I want to have everyone else that I want to impress. I said, see? (laughs) But God doesn't work that way. He kept this moment The ultimate confirmation to the eyes of faith, not everyone, not everyone. Again, if I am producing the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, my goodness gracious, I would have have won Pontius Pilate there, especially his wife, so so she can say, I told you so. Man, I, I want Caiaphas, the high priest there. I would, I would want these Roman soldiers who nailed him to the cross. I want them there. I want that crowd who shouted, give us Barabbas to be there. But God doesn't work that way. These moments are reserved only for the eyes of faith. These moments are reserved for those who walk by faith and live by faith. God saves the best for those who exercise faith. When Elijah was ascended, the Spirit of God was given to Elisha. When our Lord Jesus Christ was ascended, in the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and everyone who desired and longed for the Holy Spirit. I want to end this series of messages where I began. If you desire heaven in the hereafter, you need to walk with God in the here and now. Now, beloved, we're living in terrible times. I don't need to tell you this. I don't need to tell you this. I catch the headline news online because I can't watch the news.
We're living in terrible times. Some are convinced that we're living at the end times. I pray they're right. We're living in times where we're watching the greatest country on the face of the earth. And I say that because I wasn't born here. And because when they landed in Mayflower, they said, in the name of God, amen. They covenant with God. And we're seeing this great country facing its demise, and not by foreign powers, but some of its leaders. Why do you think I weep? I know my citizenship is in heaven, but I also know that God told Jeremiah to tell the Israelites when they get to the Babylonian, they need to seek the peace of the city, even though they were exiles. And we need to be working and praying and doing whatever we need to do to seek the peace of the city. We are seeing wholesale departure from the Christian faith, just as our Lord Jesus said it would happen in the last days. So the question is this. If you would face Jesus today, would he be your welcoming Lord and Savior and friend? Or will he be your judge? Choice is yours. If you say, well, I'm not really sure, Michael, I'm not sure. Not sure means you're not saved. Not sure means you're not saved. Because when you're saved, you are absolutely sure, not because of who you are, but because who he is. If the answer, I'm not sure, that can change today. Whether you're watching around the world, whether you're here in this beautiful auditorium, that can change today for God to give you the assurance of salvation and eternal life. Would you stand and pray with me, please? the Holy Spirit spoke to you, please come down and meet with us. All the pastors and I are going to be at front. Come and talk to us. We'll pray with you and help you in any way we can. For those of us who have known and loved Jesus and maybe even anxious for his return, what are you doing? What are we doing while we're waiting for him? Father, I pray in Jesus' name that your precious Holy Spirit move freely inside of us, convicting, encouraging, challenging, whatever he wants. As long as, Father, every one of us, speaker and listeners, would say, speak, Lord, your servant heareth. For, Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. God of God's people said, amen.